Before I begin, I have just a quick appeal and reminder to please click the bell icon next to the subscribe button if you have not done so already. That way, you won't miss any of our uploads and will be notified whenever we upload new content. Thank you. For those pondering the possibility of life after death, an important question arises. If spirits of the dead exist, is there a way to communicate with them? To answer this, many have looked to technology, and strangely enough, there are reports of technology, in particular telephone calls, supposedly being used from beyond the grave. In some reports, phantom phone calls are associated with the number 000 000 People have described receiving calls from this unusual number at or around the time of funerals, only to answer the call and hear static. Unable to explain the source of the call, they have been left wondering if it was their deceased loved one trying to speak with them one last time. In other cases, however, actual messages are delivered, with many believing that they are speaking with a living person, and not someone who has passed away. Perhaps surprisingly, telephone calls from the dead are a hot topic of research for some scientists, including psychologist Dr. Callum Cooper of the University of Northampton. According to him, the phenomenon of phantom phone calls is starting to get more and more complex with all the new technology we're creating. If you go back to the earlier stuff, you've got landline telephone, but now we've got mobile phones, we've got text messages, we've got emails. One of the earliest reports of phantom phone calls dates back to the early 20th century, when a London solicitor, David Wilson, received bizarre messages on a machine he had made himself from a wireless telegraph. Devised to use the Morse code system, Wilson's communication machine first received strange messages in 1913 when used by his friend. The signals were delivered in Morse as audible beeps. Astonishingly, the device continued to relay messages even after the receiving wire had been disconnected. With the help of a second witness, Wilson translated each message as they came through. The telephonic messages the machine received appeared to be meaningful. In January 1915, this was received. Great difficulty, await message, five days, six evening. Similar instructional phrases like wait until next Tuesday also came through. However, despite waiting, nothing ever happened that illuminated on the message's meanings. Confused as to why he was receiving such messages without any input, the solicitor invited researchers to inspect his machine and try to explain the source of the Morse code. No explanation and no source of the signal could be found. After publishing his experiments, David Wilson and his Morse code communications disappeared from the records. The case of David Wilson inspired others to ponder the possibility of electronic communications being delivered from beyond the grave. Some even took the idea further, purposefully constructing machines to aid in interdimensional communication. From 1920 to 1921, the English-born psychic medium and composer Francis Grierson claimed to have had detailed conversations with spirits on the other side by means of a psychophone. Far from speaking with any old ordinary Joe, Grierson published transcripts of conversations with Thomas Jefferson, Abraham Lincoln, and Benjamin Franklin. These conversations were extensive and intelligent and, by deviating from contemporary popular opinions, seem to suggest insight and opinion unconstrained by the time in which they were received. In Grierson's own words, the psychophonic waves by which the messages were imparted are as definite as those received by wireless methods. As unbelievable as Grierson's reports may seem, he was far from alone in his claims. Telephonic communication experiments were something of a trend in the 1920s. With the help of his eldest son, British psychical researcher F. R. Melton designed and built a psychic telephone in an attempt to converse with the dead. He even published a booklet which described in detail the different components of the machine, as well as containing expected elements including a transmitter, receiver and battery, Melton's design included a balloon at the centre which was filled with the breath of a psychic medium. 
1920, during an interview for Scientific American, inventor Thomas Edison discussed his plans to construct a similar machine. In his own words, I do claim that it is possible to construct an apparatus which will be so delicate that if there are personalities in another existence or sphere who wish to get in touch with us, in this existence or sphere, this apparatus will at least give them a better opportunity to express themselves than tilting tables and wraps and Ouija boards and mediums and other crude methods now purported to be the only means of communication. When Edison died in 1931, the fate of this invention was unknown. Some records suggest that he did indeed build a spirit phone, but that it failed to produce results. Whatever the case may be, no blueprints for any such apparatus designed by Edison are known to exist. In modern times, one can see the use of so-called ghost boxes, EVP recorders and other electronic communication-based ghost hunting devices as a continuation of the ideas proposed by inventors like Edison. For all the effort expended by those actively seeking telephonic conversation with the other side, it seems that some of the most compelling cases of phone calls from the dead have happened spontaneously, often involving people who do not realise that the person who they believe they are speaking with is dead. In 1981, parapsychologists E. E. McAdams and Raymond Bayliss published just such a case which dated back to 1978. The report described how Madeline White had returned home from work one evening to be told by her son, John, that an old friend of hers had called. Madeline stated that she hadn't seen or spoken to her friend, Edie, or her husband in several years. Regardless, the following day, her son told her that Edie had called again. When Madeline asked if she had left a number, John told her that she hadn't, but that she had said that she would call back. The next day, Edie called again. When John asked for her phone number, so that his mother could phone her back, Edie simply said, it doesn't matter. Later, concerned, Madeline phoned a mutual friend who gave her Edie's number. Upon phoning, Edie's husband answered. When Madeline asked to speak with Edie, she was met with silence. Edie's husband told her that Edie had died three days ago, of cerebral hemorrhage. After that, Madeline never received another phone call from anyone named Edie. The calls stopped the day after she was buried. The intended recipient of a call being unaware that the caller is dead has been reported by others. Another remarkable phantom phone call was described to a psychical researcher in the 1970s. The submitter explained how, some years ago, he and his grandmother would often walk together into town and back, always leaving her doors open. When his grandmother's phone bill came out to be much higher than usual, she put in a request to have her phone line disconnected, believing that someone had been taking advantage of her doors being open and sneaking in to use her phone. However, early one night, she received a phone call from her friend Lizzie Partlett in West Virginia. Her friend told her that she was going away, but that everything was alright and that she could only say a few words, but that she would hear about it in a few days' time. Understandably, the grandmother was confused as to why she had received the call when it was supposed to be disconnected. When she and her grandson contacted the operator, he reassured them that it was indeed disconnected. The line man even came out the following evening, climbed the pole and pointed out that the wire was not connected. Inside the house, the wire was also disconnected, meaning that the phone connection was broken in two places. Three days afterwards, the grandmother received a letter from the Partlet family, explaining that her friend Lizzie had died in the early night of the day before the letter was written. In all respects, the phone call was impossible. It appeared to have come from beyond the grave and received on a disconnected line. Other than branding the report as a hoax, it is extremely difficult to explain this case in terms other than the paranormal. There seems to be an endless well of anecdotal evidence of phone calls from the dead. Yet, such reports are problematic. Not only do they rely on the truthfulness of those reporting them, but also their ability to perceive and accurately judge their own experiences. Regardless of these inherent issues, it is important to stress that anecdotal evidence of strange happenings should not be ignored altogether. 
there is still value in personal experience, especially when similar accounts are reported over and over again. Whilst spontaneous cases by their very nature of being unexpected are rarely ever recorded in real time, that is not to say that it has never happened. On the 12th of April 2011, a video was uploaded to YouTube which alleges to contain the audio of a peculiar voicemail message received two weeks before. According to the description, the uploader's landline phone went to voicemail after only one ring. When she checked the voicemail message, she heard a lot of static, and then, a whispering voice. Saved message. The uploader believes that it says Grandpa. Their grandfather had passed away just a few months earlier, on December the 23rd, 2010, aged 101. It seems that as technology advances, bringing us voicemail, mobile phones, text messages and emails, so does the phenomenon of anomalous telephonic messages. Researcher Dr. John G. Combs claims to have received a series of paranormal text messages in 2009. Whilst working in his office, an old mobile phone, which had been abandoned in an office drawer, unused for several years, turned itself on and received a text. The message read, remember the anniversary. On another occasion, it did the same thing. This time, the text message read, remember the birthday. The first message had been received the day before the anniversary of his son's passing. The second, the day before the anniversary of his mother's death. With no sender information, there was no explanation as to where the text messages had been sent from, or indeed how the phone, drained of power for several years, had turned on by itself. Strangely, the old phone did not even contain a SIM card, meaning that it should not have been able to send or receive information. When considering the possibility of a text message being received with the sender details withheld or missing, some network providers have stated that this is impossible. Is it then the case that as technology advances, Spirits of the dead are provided with a wider range of mediums through which to send messages to the living. Some cases even suggest that phone calls from the dead have delivered meaningful messages, even when no words were exchanged. On the 12th of September 2008, a Metrolink commuter train in Los Angeles crashed with a freight train. At least 25 people perished in the collision. More than 100 others were injured. One of the passengers on the train was Charles E. Peck. For 11 hours after the accident, a number of his family members received phone calls from Peck's phone. His fiancée, his stepmother, his brother, his sister and his son all reported receiving calls. However, when they answered, all they heard was static. Returning the calls only went to voicemail. A total of 35 calls were made from Peck's phone to his family after the crash. The phone calls excited the rescue teams, who thought that Charles Peck might still be alive, and was simply too injured to speak when his family members answered his calls. An hour after the last call was made, rescuers found Peck. He had died upon impact. According to his fiancée, We gave the rescuers a description and they spent the next couple of hours looking for him. They did end up finding him, and they said that he had died immediately on impact and that there was no way he could have been calling us. After examining the body, the coroner was unable to find any sign that Peck had survived for any amount of time after the crash. The final call from Peck's phone came at 3.28am. His time of death was 4.22pm the previous day. When the calls were made, he was already dead. Peck's fiancée described the trauma of answering his calls. And we were yelling in the phone, you know, hang in there, baby, they, you know, we're going to get you out, you're going to be okay. And the emotional side of my brain, is, it was just Chuck letting us know that he knew that we were scared for him and letting us have hope. Thank you for watching. If you found this topic interesting and would like to learn more, I suggest reading Dr. Callum Cooper's book, Telephone Calls from the Dead 
I have put a link to it in the description, and also to our website's article which contains additional further reading suggestions. Finally, don't forget to subscribe if you haven't done so already. And if you cannot wait until my next video, why not check out the one suggested on screen now.